Today we are in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, so appreciate today that we are, uh, remember Matthew wrote to the Jews. So that was his goal, was to kind of write to the Jews. And, and it was not the first gospel written. Some believe it was the second, some say the third. Um, but it was um, it was written because Jewish people needed to hear the story. So Matthew uh, penned it all out, and uh, we are in chapter five, where Jesus is at the Sermon on the Mount. Now, remember, the Sermon on the Mount is a great uh, story of the Bible. Jesus is one of his most combined, longest teachings that he had. It is the longest one. It's also one where he is. Um, He's teaching primarily to his inner circle. Now, um, the outer circle's there, and maybe even more than the outer circle. By that, I mean you had the 12 disciples, and then you had a lot of other disciples, the support team, right? The roadies who were with him. And uh, that could have numbered at any point in time. It could have numbered into the hundreds of people. For certain, we know that it's more than 12 disciples. Now, is there a crowd? Um, some theologians will tell you that if you have uh, your Bible translation has the words of Jesus in red, you'll see that Matthew, a lot of Matthew is red. Okay, he's, he's quoting Jesus very directly. Uh, and this happens to be part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is on the northern end of the northern plains above the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's a natural shelf, like an amphitheater up there, where he is. Uh, he has uh, had this, this sermon, if you will. In fact, uh, the Catholics built a church there, um, and uh, it's still, the chapel is still there today. So, um, before Stacy reads, I want you to understand he's using metaphors here. Okay, he's using metaphors. Uh, so don't get this confused when you read about you're the salt of the earth. Lot's wife, who was turned to a pillar of salt. Okay, don't don't think literally, but think in metaphorical terms. Okay, you ready, ma'am? You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so my bride of 40 years uh, tested positive for COVID yesterday. So uh, I tested this morning at 6.30 and negative. So... I'm just as an abundance of caution. I won't get near you all. I won't shake hands, et cetera, et cetera. But just to let you know, uh, she is listening online. Uh, she somehow or another got out of the closet that I had her locked in. <laughs> so she must have gotten to her computer. So um, oh well. I'll, I'll put her back in there when I get home. So I can yeah, you will. So, uh, so today, uh, I, I begin the outline today as we think about salt and light, okay, two very important things to that era of Palestine, okay, that, that was an era where there was, light was in big demand at night, and so was salt in big demand all the time. Why did Jesus use salt and light, though, as a metaphor to these people who are listening? Something they understood. Well, something they understood. Well, and salt will lose its flavor. But light, we have all of that, one way or another. Okay. <laughs> well, um, years ago when I was traveling with the FFA, I was helping a, a young man in Utah. Uh, they had a lot of cattle, a lot of sheep. And we were up one night uh, in the mountains of Utah, and uh, we were having to go through and check. They had wolves and coyotes in that area and mountain lions. And so, we were out moving around amongst the sheep late at night, and it was pretty dark. And he taught me an interesting little trick. If, uh, if you're in the dark and your eyes are adjusted, if you do not look directly at what you want to look at, but slightly off, a couple degrees off, 
the light picks up the receptors of your retina a little bit and you can see better than if you're looking straight at something. So um, the reason he had to tell me that is because I kept falling into things, right? <laughs> you know, he, he was used to the farm. I wasn't. And, and he finally said, look, this is something that apparently had been passed down from his great granddad to his granddad, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I thought it was interesting. And it does work if you're ever really in a dark environment. If that's the door you're heading to, just look slightly off to the side and you'll be able to see a little bit better because the light catches different. Than you know, straight up um, so, but light does diminish, right? It goes up and down. I mean, uh, uh, since I had trouble sleeping, at, even at 422 this morning, um, you could look and see a little bit, right, outside. And so appreciate that, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, both salt and light were absolutely critical in the lives of the people at Jesus' time. We take both for granted today, but um, the salt, salt had many uses as a value. Uh, Rush, uh, Roman soldiers hated salt. That's worth his weight in salt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah worth his weight in salt. Um, and then they would trade. They would use it and trade it. Exactly right. Yeah. So, why else do you think salt and light is critical? Everybody understood it. Okay. So, if he was speaking to his disciples, remember, his disciples um, as a group were fishermen. Uh, there were some others. There was a tax collector and uh, a zealot who had a very checkered uh, background of work. But at the end of the day, uh, these were mainly common people. So he could talk about salt and light and they would fully understand the value and the attributes of it. Okay. Now, let's look at on your outline. Uh, so think about Jesus' day versus today. Jesus' day versus today. And there's three things. Now, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can talk about, uh, salt and light. But there's a couple that I wanted to pull out that you see today, okay? For salt, I think there's three things we have to consider. Salt had value. It's a preservative. And it seems in your flavor, okay? Yes. I think all of the people listening during Jesus' day would have readily understood that. Now, there's a lot of other things that uh, go to various commentaries that they pull out of the, the meaning of salt and the meaning of life, right? But I think these are the more common ones. Today, I think all of us can understand value preserving and seasonal flavor, okay? So in Jesus' day, we've already heard that Roman soldiers could be paid for salt. I talk about it during the sermon today. Uh, solarium is what it was called. That's the Latin root word for salary. Salary means were paid. And they were paid with salt with salary to their monthly allowance. Now, so we know there's value. How about today? What value does salt have? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kenny, Kenny's going where I wanted you to go today. Uh, salt has little value on your shelf, but to a physician, it has great value. And that is because many of us in the room are being treated for high blood pressure, and they're saying, oh. cut out the salt, right? Oh, I, and they're saying, pick up the label and look to see how much salt's in there. You better pay attention to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, today, I think we probably misunderstand a little bit about it. Uh, Performance athletes. Some of you would appreciate this trivia. Uh, University of Florida um, trainers and, and physicians were just amazed at how their athletes, their football team, the second half of the game would just run out of gas. I mean, the humidity and the heat down there. Uh, after an hour or so playing, that the football team would just run out of gas. Um, they, they began to lose games a lot. So these people got together and they came up with this concoction. Gatorade. University of Florida Gators. Gatorade. Gatorade. That's where Gatorade came from. And if you look at the label of Gatorade, you're going to discover that your physician, if you have high blood pressure, doesn't want you to drink Gatorade, okay? Because there's a lot of salt in it. 
pot of sugar. But for these athletes, it gave them, it refreshed their body because they had used so much of it. Uh, 60 pounds ago, um, the cross country team would, would be in, in, the, in the locker room, the football team would come off, and uh, you know, their coaches would hand them salt tablets. Yeah, salt pill and an orange drink. And, and how many salt tablets would they give? Two. Two. <laughs> Two salt tablets. And I thought as a cross country runner, that's not fair. So yeah. I took a couple of them one day, got that's sick that. as a dog. <laughs> you know, you just think pure salt tap. Yeah, they were very yeah. small. Yeah. I don't know. They were the size of aspirin. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it, it, it cut down cramps. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. How many people did I carry in my army training with salt? There you are. Not yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't have no salt. What's the difference between mm -hmm. kosher salt and salt? One gets yeah. blessed. <laughs> One gets blessed by a priest. Yeah. Over. I said, I just what he said uh, in basic, we constantly had salt tablets given it to us because we took it in July and August. And in Jesus' day, appreciate this, they are in an extremely arid, dry environment. I mentioned the young man that I helped out one day on his farm in Utah. Um, he came back east to the uh, uh, state president's conference, Washington, D.C. leadership conference for FFA. He passed out from heat exhaustion because he was he was used to the heat, but the humidity got him, right? And, uh, yeah, I remember kind of picking on him, you know, when he was on the stretcher. I said, boy, I could take your heat. You can't take mine. And so, <laughs> you know, it's so dry that in Jesus' day, even today in, in dry air environments, they're, they're losing, they're perspiring, but you don't feel it because it dries so quickly. And so salt was very valuable. Okay, we, we can appreciate that. Today, in a lot of the world, it hasn't changed. In the United States, your doctors say, stop your salt intake, reduce your sodium. In a lot of parts of the world, salt is still a valued commodity because they don't have it. I know it's hard to imagine, but they don't have it. Okay. Now, as a preservative, remember Jesus' day? No freezers, no refrigerators. Um, they had only a few options if they wanted to carry food over. And that was they had to dry it and or salt it. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine um, when the story of the little boy who offers up his fish and loaves for Jesus and, and they fed the 5,000. Okay, that was a salted fish. Okay, so you can imagine the fish crusted with salt and eating on that in a, in a desert dry environment. Where's the water? You know, you're supposed to be up to a water hose, but, but that's, what, that's what they did. So, in today's world, salt still has value. But I think what Jesus wants us to understand is that everything, when he calls us salt, he's saying you have value. Why is that important? Today, it's not just an American culture, probably more in America. If you travel internationally some, um, they also have that feeling too. And that is the value of people. Okay? Um, I heard a sermon once that was rather fascinating. They talked about a pantheistic society. In other words, a society that doesn't really worship a God, but worships God, you know, nature and all this stuff. And, and he was saying a pantheistic society is the one who takes people who should be under care, doesn't put them under care, and then creates legislation <coughs> so they can have homeless camps. Hmm. And I want you to think about that for a moment. We, we don't have enough capacity in mental institutions and in specialized hospital and special medical care. So where do those people end up? Oh. Homeless. Mm -hmm. So now instead of dealing with the problem, yeah. we end up saying, you know what? Um, let's just keep them out there. So Jesus needs to remind us that sometimes all people have value, right? Not just the ones who are normal, not just the ones who are like us. Can, 
It's a great question, and it's one that unfortunately I don't think we'll ever get our arms around, at least politically. But from a, from a faith standpoint, that's why I'm proud of our church for participating in wants. It gives many people in this church a firsthand understanding that even though now listen, I want you to hear the way I'm saying this, okay? Because there's a lesson in here. I'm not titling people, but I want you to hear what I'm, what I'm saying. Those people who are dirty, homeless, uh, they obviously, some of them have, as you recognize if you help, have some mental illness or, or issues. Jesus says they have value. They have value. They have hearts and souls. Yeah, they have hearts and souls. I remember the beggar who had been crippled all his life. He was laying by the pool, hoping, trying to get in there when the water stirred. What did Jesus do? He had that. Jesus healed him. That's right. Uh, you know, what, what set Jesus apart and just shocked the Pharisees and shocked his disciples is when he would walk up to a leper and touch the leper. Okay, that was a no-no. It was a no-no from a religious standpoint, from a rule standpoint, from a hygiene standpoint, from a gross standpoint, right? It, 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 it checked every box of, no, don't do this. And Jesus walked up and touched them. Right? So I want you to appreciate when Jesus talks about salt and we think of value. He's saying, you are salt, okay? You have value. Ralph? And I think he's referring to sinners also. Not yes. just a homeless person, you know, like you're saying. Sorry. Yep, yep. Any any person has value. All right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes we we think this, if you may not say it, and, and you don't have to shake your head. You don't have to say, raise your hand and say, that's me, Steve. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we say about people, you know, they're they're worthless. And I know it's a statement that we don't mean that way. But I do have to appreciate, and I'm guilty of that. Even if I don't say it, I think it sometimes. And I want you to know that Jesus reminds us that if we're salt, salt has value, and everybody has value. Now, preservative. In today's metaphor, if you will, um, preservative, we understand how to preserve things back then. It also had medicinal qualities. It still has medicinal qualities today. Uh, kind of mountain veterinarianism is if, if you're way out in the middle of nowhere and, and you have an animal that has a cut, um, you throw salt in the wound, okay? Because it, it helps cleanse it. It's not a comfortable situation. Uh, I have been out in the wilderness um, and had a cut and got my medicine kit and had a little bit of thing of salt and throw salt in the wound and it burns for a while and you say bad things about <laughs> but it, uh, it it purifies that wound and it helps and it actually you leave it in there and it kind of crust over and helps scale right so um, I've done it it's Did not you fun. Say I don't happens? recommend it okay but it does work and <laughs> so we, we have to appreciate that there is a preservative quality of that medicinal for you but I also want you to understand this Jesus is pointing to us and saying look you preserve the world <clears throat> If you're into eschatology, that's the study of end times, right? Eschatology. If you're into that study, you'll recognize that scripture is clear in two places, if not three, that it talks about at the end times, God removes his goodness or he removes his spirit from the world. That happens. All hail breaks loose. Amen. Literally. Hell comes into the world full force. Okay, there's nothing to hold back evil there. Jesus is telling us that we are preservative of good in the world. Christians are. That's our call. If you and I don't do good, who will do good? Is it done by accident? And at what level will people do good? There are all kinds of people who drive close to the speed limit who reject God, who maybe are atheists. They do that because it's 
safe, right? Will they, though, help people at the level that God calls us to help? Probably not. So who's that left? Us, right? So we're preservatives of goodness in the world. We're preservatives of those things that God calls us to do in the world. And we have to remember that. The other thing that we do is salt. We preserve the word. The word. We preserve the world from evil, and we preserve the word. The word. We are the, the conduit of God's word in the world. You, you read scripture, and then you go into the world. Now, I'm not a good role model. Maybe you are. But often, I read scripture, I go into the world, and I don't always practice everything I've read or that I understand. But that's the goal, right? So as we understand God's word, scripture, and we read it and we put it to memory, and we begin to practice it, we preserve the word in the world. That's an important point for us. Now, seasoning and flavor we get while they thought it was important. Um, I used this in the sermon this morning, and I have said it. I have heard people in this room say it. And I counseled a couple not long ago who was talking about leaving their church. And uh, not this church, but another church. And, and they said, you know, we go to church and we don't feel fed. We don't feel fed in the way it's true. Now, there's many, many reasons why they felt that way. But the point is, is I think God reminds us, Jesus reminds us in the scripture, that it is important that we recognize that salt adds flavor. It, it makes people feel like they've gotten something. And that's what we're called to do as well. Uh, so remember that. Now, light... Um, it's pretty easy to see the metaphor during Jesus' day. Uh, you know, light on your outline, it attracts and attracts attention. Um, it gives us the ability to, to kind of see where we're going, okay? Um, and secondly, we also see in Jesus' day, it takes away the unknown the fear. Uh, you can imagine in Jesus' day, they had, uh, they had wicks and some oils, but they primarily had some kind of a candle type thing. And that was their flashlights. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. That's reason. So appreciate that light was extremely important in this day. Now, today, what do you think the meaning is for us there? What do you think Jesus' metaphor for light applies to us today when it comes to attracting or to take away the unknown fear? Options with words. Say again. She said actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words, okay. How else does, does light today, when Jesus' metaphors use, how does it help attract? We're drawn to someone who is like showing light, like a, if they're a mm -hmm. Yeah, we're drawn to it. All people are drawn to light. There are a few that are drawn to darkness. Um, I, I mentioned the sermon, and this is important to remember, that there is not a culture in the world, I understand, that doesn't have some kind of an understanding that light is good and darkness is bad. Uh, all religions have conversation about that in their holy scriptures or writings, okay? Talking about evil and darkness, right? And, and the good and the brightness or the light. So. It is common to man to understand that concept. So today, like in Jesus' day, it means that to people. So we are called to attract people their attention to Jesus and God by the way we live our lives. So when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, you know what he's saying? He's saying, you're the one that's going to attract people to me. You're the one who attracts people to Jesus. It, it, it's not the dark that does it. The dark doesn't want to attract them to Jesus. The dark wants to attract them to the other side, right? And so we have to appreciate that, that we, as light, attract. We attract. We pull people's attention. So now that's some pressure, right? That's some pressure on us. That means that you are a person of light. You're an agent of light. You're a representative of the light. 
Yes, ma'am. I think sometimes the darkness or the dark side also has its own form of some kind of particular light that will draw you in. And I think the important thing is to know the difference. Yeah, well, well said. Um, yeah, one of Satan's great tricks is to mimic uh, what God does. Unfortunately, he, he diverts it, he perverts it. And so, um, so as an example, um, and, and that, that deals with sex, created by God for the perfect relationship in marriage. But then all of a sudden from that, Satan takes and pulls your attention to other things, okay? Uh, pornography and all the other things. So something that God created that was ideal, he has preferred. Uh, the same thing with, with the way people look. Um, the average teenage girl, uh, the average, actually a little over 60%, have great issues with the way they look and feel about themselves as a result of social media because they see the perfect picture right that's not me what's wrong with me i'm not good enough right and so we have to appreciate that uh that attracting has to be toward god and not the news all right takes away the unknown and the fear um you know it's uh I believe that this is a metaphor today where we need to light. We need to light toward peace and hope. All right? There's not much peace and hope. There's less all the time. And maybe it's because as I get older, I'm hanging around you all who are old, right? Some of you, a lot older, all right? And, and maybe because of that, maybe we're all looking at it and saying, boy, the world's going to Hades in a handbasket, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I increasingly live in a post Christian, Christian world. Um, the people of the Old Testament know there was their sin, they understand where it came from. We know because we've got the book. About sin and where it came from. But increasingly, sin, nothing is sin in the, in the culture we live in. She's probably out sin, you don't need to be saved. So, sin is being redefined as behavior that uh, needs to be protected from people like us. It, it, uh, so even good. if we have, well even if we're glowing in the dark, we have been redefined. And to talk to someone about sin that we're all sinners now gives offense. How dare you say something mean to me? There is no such thing as sin. She, you know, she's right because today, unfortunately, the children are taught in school that, oh, everything's okay. It, it, it's, I, I have to say that one of the biggest shocks I saw over the news in the past week, week and a half, is where New York and California are now allowing drag queens <laughs> in their costumes and all their glory to come in and read to first, second, third, fourth graders. I mean, it, I, I, I am I, I never, ever thought I would. But yeah, they're so, taught that that's okay. That's okay. You you can be whatever you want. You know, God didn't create you this way. But it, if he did, well, it's okay to change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Pat, she was just talking about drag kings. You sure you want to raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just just so there's no there's no correlation here. Okay. All right, yes. go ahead, Pat. Uh, 
Kathleen's point to her point, but remind everybody that in the history of the United States, in the 1730s and again in the 1850s, there was a movement called the Great Awakening, where people such as us started to look around and realize, wait a minute, we're going down the wrong track here. And it inspired a whole movement. As a matter of fact, the first one was directly responsible for the American Revolution because people start to question the norm, which in this case is social media, whatever it might be. Uh, that's why people are hoping that maybe Elon Musk might take over Twitter so other thoughts can surface. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can I've got a book on my kitchen table. Covers that. Still in this wrapper from Amazon that I bought. You need to read it. But I'm working on the dark ages where the relationship of church and state, knights and popes and bishops were really different than they are today. Oh, sure. 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 Really, really different. We're in a different world, but the actions had consequences. Those that are the top go to the bottom, those at the bottom go to the top. That's what inspired Mark Luther. Yes. Yeah. And the Reformation. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I totally agree with Kathleen. I think right now everything's acceptable. <laughs> Everything. It's very hard to define what is a sin anymore in our world. What is a sin? Because it's yeah. but it, don't, it, it's such a gray area. Don't worry, Doug. I'll get my wig. So I actually uh, heard somebody say the other day, "God changes with the times." Oh, good. Oh, oh, that's what that somebody said. God changes with times. Mm -hmm. And I was. Who said that? Doctor Long. Yeah. Yeah. So look, really? if if we can understand that we are that light, okay, in a dark world. Now. It, it wasn't part of your outline, but I think since you've had some of this conversation, I just want to remind you that if you slide on the scale, if you if you look at um, what we call wrong, we call right. She's doing that. Okay, and that let's call that a scale, right? And so, for some of us, we can name an action. Pick what it is. Um, Premarital sex. Cheating on taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so for some of you, it's uh, well, you know what? Those guys in one, those guys and gals in Washington, they screwed everything up. So look, I, I think that if you cheat on taxes, as long as you pay some, then you're probably here on this scale. Some of you would say, well, you know, uh, in my case, I, my bride happens to be a CPA. Um, Cheating on taxes is like over here, okay? <laughs> so that doesn't happen in our house. That's great. But but for some of you, uh, well, but you know what? You received cash for that. You don't need to report that, right? So you have this scale, premarital sex. It's on a scale, right? For most people, it's on a scale. Mm -hmm. Here's the point you need to understand. When Jesus spoke, he spoke with the understanding that there is no scale. There is no scale. It's God's word. Okay, that is a solid point. It's a point, and there's no mistaking that point. That's what God word. That's what God's word says. That's what God's intention is. Right? We get that. So it's not here or there. That's our opinions. That's our culture. That's the way we were brought up. Okay. Um, when I was an ag teacher, you know, I used to go and visit my students. That was part of your objective as an ag culture teacher to go either to their home or to their place of work. And, and uh, I remember um, as an ag teacher, we have responsibility in a shop with uh, uh, radio arm saw, band saws, uh, table saws, all those things going at one time. You learn how to hear everything and, and i've lost some of that but at one point i could hear multiple conversations going on you just get trained because fingers and toes and eyes are your responsibility as an ag teacher so you, you just become in tune to that and i remember i remember hearing one of my students in the back beginning of school 
and he was talking, using the N-word with another young man, and he was telling really bad jokes. And so instead of kicking him out, um, you know, I, I arranged to go visit his home you know, pretty quickly. So about the second week of school, I go visit his home. And after there, I met his mom and dad, uh, walked around the place with his dad. Now I know where he got the jokes from, right? So how do you change somebody that that's normal? Okay. When it's normal to tell dirty jokes and use the N-word all the time, well, if that's normal, I'm not going to change is normal. Because on the scale of how we say things and the words that we choose to use and the combination of those words, he would see those things and say, well, that's not bad. You want to hear the one I didn't tell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whereas on my scale, the words he was using and the way he used them was really wrong. Okay. Now, what do I base mine on? I ultimately, and I hope you do, is ultimately truth has to come from God's word. It can't come from my opinion. I right? think I think Met Methodist churches are, are being divided as we speak for this very reason. Okay. Yes, I think one of the hardest things in the world about being a Christian is that we each hone in on our own areas and then we feel righteous because we don't do that thing. But the reality is we're all sinners in need of grace and God doesn't see sin in degrees. So someone's, you know, coveting is just as bad as, you know, someone else's murder. And that's the hard part to wrap your mind around. God thinks lying is just as bad as murder. Yeah, so... We all, agree not that, agree. we all agree that Laura is a sinner. And I'm not, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, but she's a sinner. And, and, but she's I admit right. it. She's right. We all I'm are, the worst of right? them. We she's all like Paul. are. And we have to Ugh. see that in the light of God's word. Yes, ma'am. And our church. <laughs> you all did that to me. I'm the worst of them. <laughs> Here in this community. When you have a position of authority, you get addition, additional accountability. The chaplain, who used to be at Shenandoah University, I locked horns with him over this sliding scale issue that he was teaching to college students. The ideal is marriage between one man, one woman for life. That's the ideal, but shacking up with your roommate of the opposite sex is close. It's close. It's not ideal, but it's close. That's what you see. I took him to have fun. I the, can't imagine that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the acting chaplain they have there now was part of that conversation because she was part time employed on Gary Keaton for some task. And I pointed out to everyone in the group that she was there with her wife. And nobody else in the church knew it. I'm like, well, well, you're not paying attention. Jeez. Anyway, she is now the acting chaplain at Shenandoah University and is thrilled with diversity, inclusion, and equity, which means to die. And, and they are in they are in positions of authority within the United Methodist Church, and there's no excuse for it. None. And I think, Kathleen, you speak truth if we can all understand that. Look, my opinion first. <laughs> Katie, don't listen to this. My opinion doesn't matter, <laughs> except at home. And, and so my opinion doesn't matter on the scale. What does God have to say about it? What does God have to say about it? And let's keep going. So when Jesus talks about salt and light, he's beginning to put some responsibility on people's faith. He's doing that to his disciples. And guess what? You heard the reading today. It's on you now, right? So, so quickly, just remember in 1 John 4, 4, when we talk about taking away fears in the unknown. Um, depending on the translation that you particularly read, 1 John 4, 4 might say, uh, now you dear ones or you dear children um, are from God and you've overcome all these issues. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He's talking about God's spirit in you is greater 
than the spirit who's in the world. The power that you and I have for good to shed light on things is greater in power, greater in value, greater in importance than the evil that's in the world. So we are called to shed peace and hope and light for that, all right? Now, what does it mean when you're called to be salt and light in the world? We've been talking about that. We've got to move pretty quickly. Um, so I asked the question, how do we do this? How do we do this? And I want to go to helpful steps. There is a, there's a gazillion helpful steps, but there's a couple today that I just want you to focus on. What are some helpful steps to allow you to become salt and light in the world? Well, the first helpful step is you have to recognize. You have to begin to recognize the role that you have. You have to recognize that you influence others. You influence others. You do it every day. You might do it through a text. You might do it through Facebook, Instagram. Um, you do it when you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. Um, you know, just, just remember that... That finger does not mean number one. Okay, so so I want you to appreciate that. You know, I used to joke about that sometimes when I was an ag teacher. I'd have band little kids. Somebody drive by and they'd give me the finger, and I'd say, "Hey, look! They're saying I'm number one." You know, <laughs> you know the kids didn't know, Mr. Anchor. That's not what that means. Yes. Sir. Anyway, so recognize that you influence others. You do. You influence others. You influence others. Negatively or positively. Now, I'll tell you this. Sometimes people will say to me, sometimes I think this wrongly, that, well, I, I kind of was neutral in that, right? I'm not sure if you're ever neutral to anybody. If you sit quietly in a room when there's a debate going on and don't say a single word, you may think I'm neutral. You're making a statement. You're making a statement. It's okay if that's what you choose to do. I'm just saying, even if you sit quietly, you make a statement. Because whether you like to or not, all of us communicate subconsciously. It's called body language. And people read body language. It's a natural event. The brain just seems to pick up on My My 13-month-old granddaughter reads body language. She reads body language. Amanda, sometimes when, when Olivia's crawling somewhere she's not supposed to be, Amanda will say, Olivia, and she crosses her arm, Olivia stops. She recognized my language, 13 months old. So, so I want you to appreciate that you, you have to recognize that you influence others. You want to be salt like the world, you influence others, okay? Whether you mean to or not, you do. Yes, sir. Does that count when you're not talking to you? Yes, you're still influencing them. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Absolutely. The second thing is, if you want to learn how to do this better, how do I? How do I become salt and light? I'm going to tell you to look back. Look back. Um, sometimes go back and look at your postings on Facebook and read them. <coughs> read them. Hello. Yeah, sometimes you go, oh, I probably shouldn't have written that. Or, or look back on your day of the conversations you had with somebody and you realize I used the wrong tone of voice. I, I shouldn't have said that to them. So look back. If you want to recognize that, that these are helpful steps on training your mind and your spirit on how to proceed ahead, sometimes looking back. What you said, what you wrote, what you texted, uh, how you acted and react. Okay. Another thing, and it, it, it's corny, but I tell you, it, it still works. WWJD. Um, again, I know it's no, it corny. Be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, what would Jesus do? Um, that that reminds you of something else. It reminds you of what Scripture said. Okay. What Scripture said. But it, it also helps you to, to understand, too. How would Jesus have handled this 
in my mind what I know about him and his personality and his character and, and what scripture tells me and what I know about him in my personal relationship. So it, it, it's a little corny, but at the same time, it does work. And finally, uh, and I know we're running out of time, is balance, self-help with helping others. <coughs> Uh, there, there's a neat story in the book of John where he healed one day. He just he healed so much that he was literally exhausted. Okay. The next morning, the crowds are looking for him, the disciples are looking for him, and they finally find Jesus all alone praying. And they come up to him and say, Jesus, the people are ready for you. And he said, You know what he says? Let's go to another place because that's what I've been called to. There were people that he left who were anxious to be healed, to be taken care of, and he went somewhere else. Jesus was praying because he needed that power and that strength. So look, it is important that if you want to know how to be salt and light, sometimes you've got to balance self-help with helping others. By that, I mean, if you're not prayed of, you're not reading scripture, you're not going to be the right kind of help, the best possible help that you can be to help others. Okay? Yes, ma'am. And often, um, in those times, the people who wanted help were not wanted help from a magician, not from the son of God. And that's why, I mean, it wasn't a that's right. that token. Okay. Just do that's the right thing to do. So, um, I do this in the sermon, but one of my favorite quotes is from Edmund Burke. He was an Irish born member of British Parliament in the mid to late, mid 1700s. And he said the, the uh, only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. It's for good men to do nothing. So I, I got to tell you, folks, that if it's going, the world's going to change, if there's going to be salt and light in the world, it's up to me and you. Don't blame everybody else. God calls us individually to do this. Listen, we're the Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us the challenge of being salt and light in a, in a world that's full of darkness. And it's full of no flavor, the wrong kinds of flavor. You call us to attract people. You call us to be light. Help us to be up to that task and faithful to it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a good week. Welcome to the Grand Order of the Saints.